Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is the next instalment in the incredible series by my good friend Wayne Harbison. As ever, please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Untitled. The Feline Factor 2 The Horned Skull Chapter 2 Let's get straight into that. I could feel the malevolent urgings of whatever force occupied that skull pressing at my thoughts, trying to find a way to twist them to do its bidding. Images of murder and mayhem danced across my vision. Urges I've kept under tight control came roaring to the surface of my mind and body. They were trying to release the deepest, most primal forces of my personality and who I am. But I am a mage cat. I've held those urges in place and under control since the day I was born. I was raised with a mother who was a telepath. I know how to not only control my body and mind, but to protect them as well. I clamp down hard with my own shields such as they were, and used the iron crowbar to close the lid on the box. I heard screams of anguish in my head just before the lid abruptly cut them off. I wondered what it was about the box that seemed to cut off the voices and the compulsion of the skull. Well, it was something I would have to explore at another time. But first, I had to think. I had to sort through the conundrum that this box offered. Why would Jimmy send me this skull? What value did it have? And was it the reason that the Elu killed him? This clue brought far more questions than answers. Looking over at the box, I latched it shut and then sealed it up again, this time in an iron block. I rested several protective runes into each side of it and then reddened and sealed them. And finally, I slid it under the anvil. Anybody looking would just see another piece of Rusty metal, with some designs on it waiting to be worked. The box was obviously what the woman in the spell was asking Jimmy about. It was what they were willing to kill my friend to get back. They were not going to stop looking for it. Thinking about that, I decided it was time to start looking for this Zilla Lemek. I wasn't sure where to start, except maybe with Jimmy's boss. Locking a door to the shed, I headed back into the house, wondering... Where else I could start. As I turned over the events of the day, I contemplated my options. I didn't really have any leads on where to find this mysterious Miss Lamech, but maybe Jimmy had other friends at work who may have met her. I had a light dinner and did some reading before turning in. Tomorrow, I had plans to start asking questions at Jimmy's architectural firm. I would need my wits about me and my mind fresh. Since the previous night's gruesome task had deprived me of a good night's sleep, I decided that an early evening was in order. Now the day must have affected me more than usual, as I had nightmares of my friends being hung one by one, and I was unable to stop it. Some invisible force was holding me back, making me watch as a mysterious woman dropped a noose around each of their necks. I could see them pleading for me to stop it, but as much as I struggled, I couldn't stop the scene of horror as it played out in my dreams. I awoke suddenly when the bed collapsed and I realised that I had shifted into my battle form in the middle of one of the dreams. I forced my mind to calm down and shifted back into natural form. My mage cat form. For some reason, the dreams left me unnerved and I felt the need for my ears and tail as I pulled on a pair of shorts and t-shirt and padded downstairs for a glass of milk and maybe a piece of chocolate cake that Mrs. McCain had baked. The woman really was getting too old to be keeping my house, but, but I didn't want to let her go because her husband had recently been laid off from his job at the docks. Right now, hers was the only income coming into their home. The Great Depression 
was even hid in our sleepy little town heart. I'd made some arrangements with a grocer and butcher about any shortfall in their bill, but had to be careful not to bruise the woman's pride. Still, she was my friend, and a Northman takes care of his friends and family when they fall on hard times. As I entered the kitchen, I felt something push against the wards of the property. It wasn't a usual kid sneaking out to go fishing down on the point that I'd learned to recognize or even the occasional hobo rummaging for something to eat. It was stronger, it was mystical, and it was the kind of thing that placed a significant drain on the wards. And it was malevolent. In the distance I heard the roll of a late spring thunderstorm, and the winds began to pick up as the probe slid off the wards. The storm didn't feel natural, while well, I could feel the energy of the spell building and realized that was what had sent the bad dreams. I frowned at the thought as I felt the spell expanding, searching for something. The backlash from it hitting my wards with what was creating a thunderstorm as they drained energy from the search and dumped it into the atmosphere as heat. The fact that it was this powerful suggested that the strength of the search was a formidable one indeed. Still, I trusted my wards to hold. I fixed myself a glass of milk and cut a piece of the cake and sat down to listen to the thunder roll in. In some ways it was relaxing, especially when I realised that the cause of my nightmares was dancing out there on the winds. I doubted that they had come to realise that their search was being blocked. Part of the protection wards was to shunt a mystical hunt around the property and not appear as an actual shield. Unless they were very good at predicting the weather. Not even a thunderstorm would give it away. I finished my cake and went back upstairs, stood the broken pieces of bed in a corner and lay the springs and the mattress directly on the floor where I slept the rest of the night. There were no more probes, no more nightmares, only a slightly sour stomach in the morning from the milk. Mrs. McCain was downstairs when I came down and shaved and ready to pound the pavement. Even after four years, I was missing my long hair and the opportunity to grow a beard. Yeah, I could do it, but it wouldn't fit the image I needed during the Great Depression. I would probably be another 30 years before I could get away with a beard and long hair. I wondered how Trey dealt with it in the Navy, but then realized that he always knew where he was going and what he would do. I envied him for that. Ah, don't you look dapper this morning? She said in that rich Irish brooch of hers. Thank you. I'm going to DC today, so I won't need any lunch or dinner. Since I'll probably be all day and I'll eat there. I said with a smile and settled into the table where there was a fresh sausage, eggs, gravy and biscuits waiting on me. Oh, and don't bother with my room today, Mrs. McCain. I gotta replace my bed. She cocked an eye at me and asked with a wicked smile. You've been entertaining. And she had figured out over the few times that I had a guest stay over. Not that there had been that many over the past four years. I was wary of bringing anyone inside my wards and most of my trice were either in a hotel in Midvale or at the other participants' home. What was the saying? A woman prefers her own bed. Well, the same could be said for some men as well. With a grin and a blush, I told her, no, ma'am. I think it's just old wood. I've been hearing a lot of extra creaks in it over the last few months as it is. Last night, I was sort of tossing and turning, and it collapsed on me. I'll stop by Mr. Fenton's furniture store and have a new one delivered tomorrow. And what will you do for tonight? She asked. Well, the mattress and springs are still good. I'll just sleep on the floor with them, I told her. She shook her head and said, you are the most practical young man I've ever met. And then swatted me with a dish towel and said, Now eat up for it gets cold. Yes, ma'am. I told her and dug into the fine breakfast she had prepared. A quick stop in town to take care of the bed issue and I was off to Washington. It didn't take long to find the firm where Jimmy had worked. It was one of the more upscale establishments in D.C., and I briefly wondered why they had offices here and not in New York as they had, after all, designed the Empire State Building. 
as I approached the main offices of Mr. Yu. I was still mulling over exactly how to approach the obviously very professional men would investigate something as sordid as a suicide and hunting down a woman. However, it seemed that Jimmy had already paved the way without even knowing it. As I approached his secretary outside the huge office, I smiled at the young woman and said, Hello, my name is Wen Greenbo. I don't have an appointment, but I was wondering if I could speak with someone about my friend, James Babcock. And a woman looked up at me in surprise and said, Oh, of course, Mr. Greenbo. Mr. Yu said you might be stopping by and to show you in. Really? I asked. Yes. Mr. Babcock spoke highly of you and suggested that you may wish to hire the firm's services, she said, disappearing into the big doors behind her. Thanks to my enhanced senses, I heard a voice quite clearly. The young man that Mr. Babcock said may wish to hire our services to design a rather eclectic home is in the outer office, Mr. Yu. Now that was something I hadn't considered. I was perfectly comfortable in my little Queen Anne. I wondered what made Jimmy think that I might be wanting to build a new home. Please, send him in. I heard a man's voice say. It didn't take long for the woman to return and do as she was bade. Entering the well-appointed offices, I saw a tall man with green hair and a very elegant and angular features getting up from his desk. He was dressed in a smart business suit and there was the unpleasant smell of stale tobacco about him. That was the one thing to which I was having the most trouble adapting to in the past. Everybody and their brother smoked. Welcome to Port U and Marks, Mr. Greenbow. The late Mr. Babcock told us a great deal about you. He gestured towards a large, overstuffed chair and said, Won't you sit down? Thank you, I told him. I decided to let him make his sales pitch and maybe get more information on how to proceed. My dad always told me that you can learn more from someone by letting them talk than by asking them questions. And since both he and mum had been investigators and agents for the DNA and our home reality, I considered his advice to be good. James said that you would eventually want something larger, something with unusually high ceilings and large doors. He thought you'd be interested in a large home, what would co-equally be a mansion. He mentioned that you were living well below your station in life, Mr. Yu said. I thought about that. I hadn't really considered whether or not I had outgrown the house. In many senses, I had. I was still just one man who rarely entertained anyone other than close friends. I had no family to speak of. On the other hand, though, there was a certain danger to being what I am in a house such as mine. Last night's adventure with the bed was a case in point. Brunhild had, on more than one occasion, told me to live my life like a Northman, like the grandson of Jarl. Up until recently, my current residence has suited my needs and, to be honest, I hadn't considered a new home. But now that I think about it, the construction of a home like you described would solve several problems for me at once. What other suggestions did Jimmy make? I asked. And sensing that he had a client, Mr. Yu smiled and leaned back in his chair and said, well, James said that you value your privacy, Mr. Greenbow, and that you were a good friend. He said that you had unusual tastes and, and made several early sketches and designs too, which I could approach you with at a later date. Some of them are quite unusual, but he felt they would be important to you. I nodded, listening to what he had to say. Evidently, he thought long and hard about the kinds of things I would need to keep my secret, yet live well. I actually appreciated that. I nodded and said, I'd love to see what he came up with. That of course can be arranged, Mr. U said. But you said that you hadn't considered a new home. That suggests that you had another reason for visiting us. I nodded and considered my line of questioning carefully. I wanted to get as much information as possible without giving away anything. And finally, I said, James sent me a, a package that I believe was ultimately intended as some kind of gift for a lady that he was seeing. 
It appears to be quite valuable, and I would like to make sure that she gets it, but I only have her name. I'm trying to be as discreet as possible. I was wondering if someone from your office could help me find her. Her name is Zilla Lamech. Well, I could see the look of surprise in his face. I, I was unaware that Mr. Babcock and Miss Lamech were becoming involved, Mr. Greenbow. It is highly unusual for our architects to become socially attached with our clients. I nodded and began to weave a spell to loosen his inhibitions. I released it and said, I understand, but I don't wish to cause the lady any embarrassment, but being as the gift is quite valuable, and in these financial times, even someone of great wealth would hate to lose such an asset. You say she's a client of yours? I could see the spell begin to take effect. It wasn't as powerful as I would like, as I could neither wrist nor redden it, but it was affecting him. He nodded and said, Our firm is designing a building for her here in Washington. Mr. Babcock was responsible for designing the interior support structures and was working rather closely with her. She had some <laughs> unusual requirements for it. I see. I said. Could you possibly put me in contact with her? I asked. Ah, that's an unusual request, Mr. Greenbow, he waffled. But under the circumstances, I think I can arrange it. I do feel the need to let the lady know you'll be calling, however. Of course, I said. Like I said, I wouldn't want to cause her any embarrassment. Normally, I would handle something like this through Jimmy's father who is my banker and my financial advisor. But under the circumstances, I'd rather not trouble him any more than he already is with the loss of his son. You are a considerate man, Mr. Greenbow, the man said. I tried to treat people with respect, Mr. E. I told him with a smile. Well, I can see that, he replied. I think I can trust you to be discreet with whatever you may learn. Of course, I said. I am even more protective of my friend's reputation than I am of strangers, Mr. Yu. Raising an eyebrow, I said, I am even more protective of their persons. He nodded to me and said, well, I'll see that Miss Johnson gets you the contact information, Mr. Greenbow. I could tell he wanted to press me about the house, and I smiled and said, I'd also like to set up an appointment with one of your architects to discuss the other project. I find that it intrigues me, and honestly, it did. My grandfather had a rather large steeding in Alfim, and Trey was set to inherit our house in Alabama. Something of my own. <laughs> it would be nice. Making my mark on this world out from under the rather famous brother's shadow had an appeal I hadn't realized existed. I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Greenbow. Miss Johnson will arrange that for you. And ten minutes later, I was on my way over to Massachusetts Avenue, to a rather large mansion. I raised an eyebrow at the sight of the place. This was a level of ostentation that was considered to be in a bad taste during these times. Personally, I didn't have a problem with people who generated wealth. Well, it takes capital to drive industry, and without industry, there are no jobs. But at the same time, picking a fight with a great many people is not always the wise thing to do. This was a huge mansion on a large estate. It was at least 50 rooms and I could see that only a portion of it was being occupied. It was, however, well cared for. Again, I found myself playing this by ear as I approached the large front door. Ringing a bell, I waited. It wasn't long before a butler answered the door. He was a short, heavy-set man with thick jowls and dark eyes. Every brown hair was in place and his white gloves were spotless. Well, there was something about him that felt strange. It wasn't evil, but it was in pain. If I'd been a telepath like my mother, then I'd been able to tell more. As it was, I was limited to using my own senses and powers. Yes, he asked. My name is Wayne Greenbow. I believe Mr. Yu's office called to announce that I was coming on over. 
Yes, the man said. Miss Lamech is currently not in. I nodded and reached into my pocket for one of the cards I'd printed up a few years ago. I was a friend of Mr. Babcock. I have something for Miss Lamech from him. I told him producing the card. He looked at the card and then looked at me. I could see both fear and curiosity in his eyes. He looked back at me and said, Miss Lamech is currently out of the city, Mr. Greenbow. I'm not sure when she will be back. I could see conflict in his eyes. For a moment, I watched as a thin line of his mouth tightened and then relaxed as he was trying to find a way to say something. I switched my vision over to my other sight and I could see his body outlined with a force of a spell, the kind I recognized. It was what I expected, a variation of compulsion. This poor man knew something was wrong. He may know exactly what was wrong, but I was unable to act on it. In a way, it was like a living hell. What I didn't know was that was going to be the theme of this mission. Thank you, I told him again as I left. This encounter told me far more than what would meet the eye. Lamech may not be Jimmy's murderer, which I believe she was, but she was definitely a nocturnal. That put this mission directly in my area of responsibility. It was time to go home and wait for the next move. In the meantime, I could be sharpening my blades. It was actually over a week before anything came to pass with the situation. I did manage to meet with Mr. Yu's company again to discuss a new home. We agreed on some general design plans. I liked Jimmy's idea of high ceilings and oversized doors. I also ran with the idea past Jimmy's dad. I passed the age where my trust fund was released so I had full access to my money. But I still ran major purchases past him. He agreed that perhaps if I were to carry out some of the other business investments we discussed, then perhaps a more impressive domicile was in order. And there was still the situation with the Cold Creek Mine in West Virginia that was reporting a little too high of a profit margin. I still had other projects going and the group was slowly drifting back together, so there were also social obligations. We continued to plan our camping trip into West Virginia and both Betty and Dot started hinting at girlfriends they might be willing to ask. To keep things balanced. We both asked them not to. Long John was uncomfortable with the way that might look with his congregation. And I just didn't have time for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I'm supposed to be this slutty wet tiger But to be honest, I was more focused on other things right now. To worry about getting my lance waxed. Uh, for one thing, I wanted to find out more about these Illu, and so I spent a great deal of time in a library at Midvale and at Georgetown University. Oddly enough, the stuff at Midvale was far more useful than Georgetown. There were some pretty damn good scholars there, and they didn't get half the credit that their colleagues in the other universities got. Professor Brainard in the Applied Sciences and Chemistry departments was an absolute genius if not a bit absent-minded. Professor Harper in the archaeology and geology department, of course, was brilliant, even if he did sound like a fictional blue-clad Sentai hero from her own childhood. His philosophy seemed to be the more syllables in a word, the more it was worth. What I found out about the Elu was there only because of Dr. Harper and his association with several other in the know, archaeologists and anthropologists throughout the world. There was actually a rather good occultism section of the library. What surprised me the most was that some of the books had come through donations from a university in New England that I thought was entirely fictional. I could see a lot of influence from the recondite order determining what got published and what didn't. I did find out that the Elu had popped up several times in history had to be put down. It would seem that their modus operandi was to gain influence over several prominent people and direct things from behind the scene. Oddly enough, most of it was in Europe and with very little activity here 
in the U.S. I wondered how much of what my mother refused to discuss had to do with that. I was coming out to the library late one evening, a little more than a week after my meeting with Mr. Yu, when I ran into George. He smiled at me and said, You know, when you graduated, you can leave the library now. Hell, you can leave the whole school and nobody will say anything. I returned the smile and replied, I had some research to do. It turns out that the Midvale Polytech Library was some of the best sources. What are you doing here? Looking for you, he said. And from the look on his face, I got the feeling that it was bad news. What's wrong? I asked as we walked down the long granite steps in the fading summer, Virginia summer light. Uh, most of the gang has backed out of the camping trip, he said. Really? I asked. Uh, what's up? And he shrugged and said, Dot got a call from her advisor. She has to do a summer class in order to get one of the classes she wants this fall. And Long John said that something came up with his congregation. He shrugged and added, And Betty said that she didn't want to be the only woman on the trip. I can understand that, I said. So, it's just you, me, and Eddie? Pretty much. Eddie doesn't want to back out because he's been looking for a chance to do some camping for a while. As for me, I get the feeling that the more you start pouring through those books, the more you're going to need someone to watch your back. As we meandered our way across campus towards the parking lot, I nodded and said, Thanks, George. Now, it was an unusually cool evening for a Virginia summer, and I was actually glad for the long sleeve shirt that I was wearing. It hadn't taken me long to adjust to the Model A and then the Great Depression clothing styles, but there were times when I missed the clothing of my own era. There is something to be said for t-shirts and zippers, the latter of which was just now being introduced by clothing manufacturers. Suddenly, I felt something surge against my wards. Something was pushing past them, and that meant it was either something very powerful or a normal human being who meant ill will. And I grabbed George by the arm and said, Come on, we have to get to my house. What? he asked, seeing the strain on my face. Something's wrong, I said as I was overwhelmed by a horrific odour of death and decay around us. And then, out of the shadows of a nearby building, four men charged. I didn't need my mage sight to know what they were. They were the walking dead, revenants with a directed will. They moved like their limbs were stiff or were on strings being pulled by some unseen puppeteer. Yet, they were not slow, but moved with a unnatural speed. Although their hair ran a gamut from black to blonde, they were all covered in some dark powder that gave it and their skin an eerie cast. Their faces were sunken and clung to the bones as if there was no muscle left beneath it. Their forms were angular and gaunt as if they'd been starved for many weeks. And they were onto us before I could recover from the backlash created by the assault of my wards, and so I was slow to react. And I felt myself torn away from George by all four and twisted hard against their inhuman strength. They completely ignored my companion and concentrated their attack on me. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw George picking himself up from the ground as he reached into his jacket just before one of the bodies blocked my view. And shaking my head, I tried to clear my thoughts as the men clawed at me, their fingers trying to sink into my skin. As one grabbed me about the face, I felt a chill from the contact. And struggling to get my bearings and regain control of myself, I threw my attackers from me and growled. I felt my body shift into my natural form and deployed my claws as the tiger deep in my soul began to take over my mind and body. The vast majority of time, we mage cats are not susceptible to our beast within, as we are born shapeshifting. However, 
in times of great emotional turmoil, like the death of a loved one, or when our minds are not at full capacity as I was now. It could and would sometimes take over when threatened. I felt my clothes begin to rip as the tiger roared to demonstrate its dominance. I didn't take my full battle height, but I could feel myself growing as the world became brighter around me. My mind shifted down to something more primal, more infra than ultra, more animal than man, as the tiger's mind shielded me from the assault on my wards. As if from a dream, I watched as my body lashed out at the attacking revenants with full strength and claw. They seemed to show no fear as they continuously charged me, only to have their limbs ripped from their bloodless bodies, bones to be snapped in two or to be eviscerated with a single blow. My tiger was not pulling his punches but was instead carrying out my lady's commission. A singular backhand caught one of the undead attackers in the chest and held him straight back with so much force that his body tore through a nearby automobile. Some part of my mind registered that it was mine. As the Revenant picked himself up and charged back towards me, I heard the sound of gunfire begin to echo off the buildings. I watched as the head of the creature exploded in a rain of bloodless brains and then slumped it against the green painted remains of the La Salle. I turned to see George holding the gun. His face was pale and his eyes were wide. He looked at me, looked at the gun, and smiled wanly. I could smell his fear. Even in the more animal state of my mind, his form, his scent registered as friend or ally, if not streak. I turned from him and headed off into the copse of woods on the other side of the parking lot and towards the direction of the source of my pain. In other words, towards where my wars had been shattered. And it was the last thing I remembered that night. I awoke the next morning naked and covered in muddy soot and ash as a fireman was checking my pulse. Behind him, I could see the sun coming up over the little peninsula at Burnt House Point. I looked around and realized that I was next to the water's edge, where the tunnel of my hidden room came out. I could see the tracks where he had come through the tunnel, as if searching for survivors. Hey, somebody get the duck over here, he yelled. Looks like he survived. And turning back to look down at me, he said, Looks like you crawled out of a fire, naked. And shaking my head, I sat up and immediately regretted it. What fire? I asked. Your house. It burned down last night. Oh, it looks like you barely made it out alive. He said, pulling his jacket off and wrapping it around my shoulders. Fire? I asked, my head still full of cobwebs. Oh, I hurt all over, and it was a deep soul-wrenching hurt. I reached out for my wards and found them shattered, destroyed and erased. And since they had been built using my own blood, my own energy, their destruction had backlashed into my body, which in a way was good because it made me look like hell. And suddenly, two men came over, the small rise leading up to the pine copse between me, the hidden landing, and the house. I recognized the bald pates of Mr. Babcock, Jimmy's dadders, one of them. Well, he looked very upset. The other was a younger man in his late twenties or early thirties. Well, he was actually quite handsome, with a pate of unruly blonde hair and grey eyes. Well, he was carrying a traditional doctor's black bag and was covered in soot. Not far behind them was a worried looking George. I vaguely remembered the attack of the school and wondered how that got explained away. I guess my confusion and my appearance was just what was needed to explain how I survived a fire like that. I still had no idea what had happened. Are you okay? The doctor asked as he began to examine me. I shrugged and said, I hurt. And it was the truth. Payne and I were 
not very good acquaintances. At least, this kind of bone-deep pain. I never get sick. I heal from what few injuries I do receive rather quickly. I accept in those, of course, inflicted by Amber, and I'm damn hard to hurt as it is. No doubt, he replied as he took a stethoscope and checked my heart and breathing. Cough, he told me. I did as bade and smiled. I hope you aren't gonna pull out a glove and ask me to turn my head and do that here on the beach. He frowned over at me and said, I have I thought it was necessary, but unless you are feeling pain there, I think we can skip that exam. I nodded and said, I feel pain all over. That's probably a reaction to the adrenaline when you crawled out of the house, he said. From the looks of things, you had to fight your way down the basement to get out. Place went up fast. I nodded and wondered exactly what he was talking about. I didn't know how anybody with a supernatural intent could get in to burn the place down. Mr. Babcock looked at me and asked, Are you okay, Wynn? I smiled over at him and said, I'm fine, sir. Just a little confused. Ah, there's no wonder at that, he said. The place is a complete loss. The fire chief says it looks like the oil tank for your furnace exploded and took out most of the ground floor. So, the house is a total loss? I asked. He nodded and frowned, saying, Ah, looks that way. Several of the outbuildings are still standing and the safe is okay, although it came through the floor and is now in the basement. Ah, it looks like the door... It may be warped. We'll probably have to hire someone to cut it open. I laughed at the thought of hiring someone to break into my own safe. The doctor gave me a strange look, so I smiled at him and said, It's either a laugh or a cry, Doc. Which would you prefer? He grinned over at Mr. Babcock and said, I can't find anything wrong with him that a bath, a hot meal, and a set of clothes won't cure. Guess I'll be checking into the Local hotel, then, I said. You'll do no such thing, Mr. Babcock said. You'll come and stay with me until we get something else worked out. And I shook my head and said, Thank you for the kind offer, Mr. Babcock, but I think under the circumstances, it would be best if I stayed at a hotel. I hoped he'd get the message. He made to reply, but he seemed to think for a moment longer and finally said, I'll make arrangements for you to stay at the Colonial. I smiled at him and said, Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. From then, things turned to a haze until I had a chance to settle down. It was a couple of days later, after several obligatory visits from my friends, that George approached me about what happened at the college. I had been out to the house once to look over things and ensured that the skull was there where I'd left it, which it was. And so I knew that he and several others were picking through the rubble. He was nervous and I could tell he was out of sorts. As we sat at the table in the dining room of the hotel, I said, Spit it out, George. And he grinned and asked, Am I that obvious? Uh, to someone who's been around you for a while? Yeah, I told him as I picked and my eggs. Well, we were going through the rubble around the house and I found something. I didn't want to turn it over to the buttons because I was afraid they may think you had something to do with the explosion, he said quietly. What did you find? I asked him, my heart sinking to my feet. That was the last thing I needed to have had happen. It was part of a a wooden box. On it was stamped Spartan Explosive Company, 25 pounds TNT, shipped to Cold Creek Mines, WV. He whispered to me. And didn't you tell me you had a mine in West Virginia? You needed to check out? And George knew I was wealthy. He'd asked about it not long after we'd met. I don't think he understands just how much I'm worth but he knows I'm worth a whole lot more than I let on. I nodded and said, 
Yeah. According to the reports I'm getting out of it, the profit margin is just a little too high. He said, I don't know how much you remember about that attack, but the things that jumped us. He swallowed hard and turned just a little green around the edges. Jumped you were dressed as miners. Joe says they were something called revenants. I nodded and asked, and how did Joe get involved in this? I had to call someone to help cover up the fact that your car had been smashed and there were four dead bodies in a parking lot of Midvale College, he said. Well, he and Martin did a good job of covering it up and getting the police off the case. I nodded. I knew that the recondite order had connections in half the police forces around DC. That favor probably cost Joe a pretty penny. I smiled and said, I held up both of you and Joe. Well, he shook his head and said, No, well, that was just partial repayment for what you did to save Eddie and the rest of us. Not to mention what you're doing about Jimmy. I smiled and said, ah, That's what my faith is all about, George. When we give gifts or do favors for each other, we strengthen the ties between us. And he nodded and frowned. Do you know what this attack was all about? He asked. I have a good idea. Jimmy sent me something that Miss Lamech, she wants back. Did they get it? He asked worriedly. And I shook my head and said, No, I think that's why they blew the house up. They were hoping to shatter my wards. Which they did, and so they could find it. But there are other things than just those wards hiding it. Do I want to know? He asked. Uh, probably not, I told him. What do you want to do about the crate? He asked. I thought for a moment. I think I need to check out that mine now more than ever. Is there a connection? And if so, what? He smiled and said, I thought you'd say something like that. Eddie and I have arranged to get some time off. Well, actually, for me, it's a working holiday. I'm going to be doing some surveying for the Department of Interior about running roads through there. I nodded and said, Good, the experience will probably come in handy someday. I didn't tell him that he was being set up to become a major player in the WPA. When did we leave? I asked, realizing that he'd already made plans. This Saturday, he told me. Get your gear packed and I'm taking a trip to visit my grandfather's home tomorrow to hide something. And then I'll be ready to go. The Feline Factor Two, the Horned Skull, Chapter Three. Let's get straight into that. Getting things together for our camping trip turned out to be easier than expected. Eddie had already got our list put together and gathered a lot of the equipment we'd need. I purchased a couple of good tents, or at least as good as you could get in the thirties, and the supplies we would need. We were at my place or at least what was left of it, packing up the gear. As we loaded it all into the back of the four pickup I'd bought for this trip, I watched my companions carefully. George, of course, knew what was going on, but I hadn't heard anything about Eddie knowing. Has George talked to you about the reasons we're going on this trip? I asked. Eddie grinned up at me with eyes of jade and said, We're going after the bitch who killed Jimmy. I raised an eyebrow at his comments and said, Yeah, but I'm afraid it's likely to be the same kind of situation that we had with Lucy. Uh, he shook his head and said, No, not this time. Then they were just planning on killing us. This time they managed to actually do it. I'm not going to let that slide. How much has George told you? I asked. That somebody called Ilu got into Jimmy's head and started him to thinking crazy things. That they killed him because he wanted out and made it look like he hung himself. 
that they sent some kind of walking dead to kill you and blew up your house, he said, hefting a large pack onto the back of the truck and then picked up the Henry 44 rimfire and lay it into the back of the truck alongside the pack. I took a moment to admire the weapon. My dad said his dad described it as that Yankee gun you could load on Sunday and shoot it all week long. We had some good knockdown power and was about as quick firing as a gun as you could get without going into semi-automatic. For bear? I asked. That'll work, he said with a grin as he grabbed another load to put on the truck. Eddie, you do realize how dangerous this is, don't you? I asked. He stopped and looked me in the eye. I'm not stupid, Wynn. I know what we're dealing with, and creatures like Lucy. That's one of the reasons I'm glad Dad and Betty decided to stay behind. I don't want to be worrying about them when we take these palookas down. I nodded and put a hand on his shoulder and said, Then you understand why I'm worried about you, I told him. He shook his head once and said with his usual defiance and confidence, The difference is that I'm not a skirt. I can take care of myself. I'm not questioning your manhood, Eddie. I just want to make sure all my friends come back in one piece. I don't want to bury any more of them, I told him. Don't you worry about me none, Wing Greenbow. You just help me watch out for George. He's a little soft when it comes to being outdoors. Really? I asked. Yeah. He told me he's never been camping before, at least not deep in the woods. He replied as I loaded the extra canisters of fuel into the back of the truck. We were heading deep into the backwoods of West Virginia, and I had no idea how far it would be between filling stations. Eddie looked at the canisters and asked, You realize we, we have a wreck and those things get punctured. We'll go up like a Roman candle, don't you? I nodded and said, I know, but I don't want to run out of gas somewhere back in the mountains and not be able to get out. Uh, have you thought about what you're going to do if we do find this Zilla Lamech? In the West by God, Virginia? He asked. I grinned at his use of popular expression and nodded. I'm going to take them down, Eddie. I'm going to make sure that they know that I won't stand by and let them hurt my friends. If they're up to something worse, then I'll deal with that too. Remember what I told you guys back after the mess with Lucy. I stand between humanity and those that were free and chained. Eddie stopped and put his hands on his hips and asked, Exactly. What does that mean, Wynn? Are you going to go after anybody who starts making noises about conquering the world or something? I nodded, thinking of that madman in Germany who, within a few months, gained a majority in the Reichstag. Yeah, something like that, I said. It means that my lady has given me the mission to make sure that mankind chooses its own destiny and isn't dominated by beings like Lucy or these are Lou. We don't interfere with anybody who is just living their lives, but when they move to hurt people, we're supposed to step in. I'm afraid you're going to be dancing a jig before this is all over, Win, he said. I shrugged and told him. Maybe, but we've been doing it since before. The Israelites were wandering in the desert and I suspect we'll be doing it long after mankind has left for the start. You think we'll eventually get to the other planets? He asked. Eddie was a devourer of any science fiction and fantasy. I just hit on his favorite subject. Yeah, eventually, I told him. I'm not sure that we haven't already been there, but I've just forgotten. Now you do sound like that Edgar Rice Burroughs fellow, he said with a grin. I've read him, I said, and several others as well. Our tastes in literature aren't that different, my friend. I know, he said with a grin. You just wear it better than I do. I laughed and said, Maybe so, my friend, maybe so. But remember, when the claws come out, I want you and George out of the way. I don't want to see you hurt. The Alu are stronger than normal men, and I bet they're harder to hurt. I won't let you down, when he said. And I won't let them get away with killing Jimmy. I nodded as I realized he wouldn't be deterred. He wanted a piece of the Elu, and I couldn't blame him. Still, it would make my job that much harder. Well, keep the Henry close. Will do, 
he said, grinning. The trip into the Agony Mountains and then deep into the Appalachians was bumpy at best and at times downright dangerous. Even in my time, those mountains were rough terrain and the roads were winding and steep. In the early 30s, they were nearly non-existent and what would have been a trip only a few hours turned into a three-day journey. We stayed our first night out in a small boarding house in Guard Gap on the Virginia side of the state line. The food was good and the owner was glad to have paying customers so she treated us well. She even sent us the next morning with a batch of biscuits wrapped in an old flour sack. The crossover at the state line was startling. The paved road ended abruptly and we found ourselves on a rutted gravel road that shook us around in the cab of the Ford like dice in a gambler's hand. It was everything I could do not to keep us moving at times as there were areas where the road had completely washed away. It was a rough day and we only made it as half as far that day as we did the first. When the sun finally set, we ended up camping on the side of the road, which was sort of what we were planning to do in the first place. It was a pleasant night and I genuinely enjoyed being out under the stars as the full moon rose over the Algony Mountains. Eddie and George kept shooting me quick glances and then would look up at the moon. And finally, I leaned back and, laughing, said, I'm not going to shift on you tonight, boys. I'm in complete control. And both of them blushed in my direct comment, and Eddie asked, Were that obvious? I nodded my head and said, You look like you were expecting me to shift into my battle form and head off into the night. I stopped and looked at each of them and said, You are aware that I recognize both of you as friends, no matter what form I'm in or even what state of mind I'm in. I turned to George and said, Remember when they blew my house up? Even then, when the cab was running things, I recognized you as an ally. I didn't attack. And George nodded and said, well, I wondered about that. He stopped and looked at me and said, Wynn, would you mind telling us about what you are? Maybe then we can understand where you're coming from. When you shifted that evening, it was completely different from when you fought Lucy's men. I mean, then you were almost playful in the way you looked, mostly human and with fur, and a cat's tail and ears. But when you fought those creatures, you went to something completely different. I nodded. I had wondered which one of them would eventually ask about these things. It was a testament to how much they trusted me in that they'd waited this long. I sighed, sipped my coffee, and leaned back against the stump. <sighs> okay, well, first off, I'm not a wet tiger. But, Eddie interrupted. I raised a hand and said, I'm a mage cat, although I take the form of a tiger, ranging from the size of a house cat, all the way up to a Siberian tiger, or even my battle form. None of them are my true form, the form I was born in. You weren't born looking like you do now? Eddie asked. And I shook my head and said, No, I was born looking pretty close to this, but with a cat's ears, a tail, and whiskers. I didn't bother to tell them that I was actually born of a woman, but instead, I was cloned in one of the UN's illegal facilities. And that would take too much explaining to do. That is my natural form. My mother taught me to look normal, completely human. Almost from birth, I told him. Was your mama a mage cat? Eddie asked. And I shook my head and said, No, my mom was an elf, a Nordic elf. And she was a natural shapeshifter too, and could look like anyone she wanted to. Uh, she could read minds and cast magic spells as well. It made it easier for her to teach me. And Dad, well, he was a mage cat. What's the... What's the difference between a mage cat and a were tiger? George asked. Although some were cats, usually a higher percentage of them than other shifters, may have the mage gift and can cast spells. They can only do it while human. I can do it in any form I take. That is that gift from Freya. I smiled. Among other things. 
Are there any drawbacks? Eddie asked. I mean, like werewolves and silver. I chuckled and said, You have no idea how many times I've been asked that. First off, although silver will affect the vast majority of werewolves, it won't affect all of them. Some, the true breeds, will only get angry if you stab them or shoot them with silver. As for me, I'm not affected by it at all. There is something that I'm affected by, but I won't tell you what it is. Why not? George asked. Although I trust you, I don't trust Alu not to be able to pick it out of your minds. I lied. You told Joel there were nine of you, George said. I nodded and said, There are already supposed to be nine of us at a time. I was sort of an accident, so there were some arrangements that had to be made. A deal with me being the tenth. My being sent to Colonial Bay is part of that. So you've been sent here as some kind of punishment or for something you didn't do? Eddie asked. I shook my head and said, No. I was sent here because you need me here. If I don't deal with these things that I've been sent to deal with, then the world will be in a lot of hurt. But outside of Lucy, all you've done so far is work your ass off in school. Eddie said. I nodded and replied. I remember. I'm not supposed to interfere with normal humans or even with what Martin calls the dark breed. Unless they're doing something to hurt common folks or the balance of power. About this magic thing, Eddie said. Yeah, I asked. How useful was it? He asked. Can anybody do it? I shook my head and said, No, there is a type of magic that anyone can do. It's called sorcery. And it's one point on which to recondite order, and I agree. Practitioners of it need to be dealt with immediately. How is it different? George asked. Well, sorcery is the practice of summoning demons, devils and other spirits and making vile packs with them for power. It usually involves the spilling of blood. Well, that's not the kind of thing we want to encourage, I told them. I would say not, George replied. But what you do isn't sorcery? Eddie asked. And I shook my head and said, What I do is magic. There are some basic principles that it all follows, but in the end the power comes from my own personal energy. Too much and I get tired. I didn't tell them the addition of the transhuman genes that I have gave me an endurance beyond most other mages or even mage cats. To be honest, I think the only mage cat who could truly go toe-to-toe -to -toe with either myself or Trey was Leaf Hunter, and his mother was Our Lady. Magic comes from inside of us. Sorcery comes from another source. I think that's why the recondite order is so rabid. They think that all the magic comes from sorcery. So, you're not going to turn into that thing I saw a couple of weeks ago? George asked. I looked at him and said, That thing? That's me, George. He blushed slightly and said, well, I guess I could have said that. A little better. Probably, I told him, with a smile to show that there were no hard feelings. Okay, uh, let me ask you something else, Eddie said. Shoot, I replied. When's there going to be a dame on your side? I've watched you for almost four years now and I haven't seen you chase a single skirt for more than a few weeks. I smiled and said, I borrowed from the first President Roosevelt's attitude. Which is? he asked. Catch and release, I told him. I'm not looking to settle down. I know a few people that, when we want to scratch an itch, we take care of each other, I said. Who? Eddie pressed. I shook my head and told him. I'm sorry. I won't go telling secrets out of school. My dad told me better than that. And I really don't want to have to explain that, on occasion. Those friends weren't always female. Let's just say that when I was younger, growing up in Europe, we had an expression, friends with benefits. Eddie raised an eyebrow and said, That's rather metropolitan of you. I shook my head and replied, I never said it wasn't. None of us want to settle down, but sometimes we like to play so we give each other a call. 
We all know the score and don't want to put any pressure on anyone else more than a good night and maybe dinner and a movie. And sometimes it's just somebody to talk to. You are one strange man, Wynne Greenbo, George said. Ah, so you guys keep telling me, I replied. But I'm me. I live my life on my terms. So, what are we going to do tomorrow when we get to the mine? George asked. Well, look around first. Look around town. Restock our supplies. I want to keep the tank and those extra cans full on the truck. We might have to move fast and for a long time and I want to make sure that we've got the fuel to do it. I'm going to the mine to check over the books. Something is just wrong about the whole setup. I'm all for the making of profit, but when that kind of margin is coming in, it usually means somebody is cooking the books. And that kind of thing could blow up in my face. You think Miss Lamech is going to be there? George asked. I'm not sure. She hasn't found what she's looking for, I told him. She could be back in Washington or even Colonial Bay looking for it. And what is she looking for? Eddie asked. A skull, I told him. A skull? Like somebody's noggin? The redhead asked. I laughed. Not just anybody's noggin. This one had a set of horns sticking out about six or seven inches from each eye. It's also slightly larger than just anybody's noggin. And its eye sockets glow with a hateful light that reaches into your brain and tries to control you. George whistled and asked. And this is what they were trying to get when they killed Jimmy? I nodded and said, yep. You know where it is? He asked. I nodded. Where? Eddie wanted to know. I shook my head and said, it's best if you don't know. If you don't know, then they can't pick it out of your thoughts. And what about your thoughts, Wynn? Uh, mine are a bit harder. My mom was a telepath. When I realized that they had no idea what that meant, I explained. She could read minds. She taught me how to protect my mind. Can you read minds? Eddie asked, suddenly worried. I shook my head and said, No, but I've learned to tell when someone is trying to read mine and how to block them. Why, well, that's a lot of work and I usually would rather not have to worry about it. Well, that's one of the reasons that Lucy couldn't control me. I smiled and looked at George and added, That and the fact that there were far more interesting things to look at when we met. And George chuckled and said, You're right there. I can't believe I took my eyes off that rack to look at her face and she had me. Well, she was new to her power. I'm not sure that that trick would work now, I said. Where do you think she is now? Eddie asked. Oh, I'm not sure. I suspect somewhere in New York, Boston or Chicago. Vampires lose themselves in cities with big populations. That way, the occasional body showing up isn't as big of a news as it would have been in Colonial Bay. The other two nodded and George said, I think I'm... I'm gonna turn in now. I'm sore and tired. I don't think you managed to miss a single hole in the road so far, Win. I smiled and made a rude gesture at him. He just chuckled, shook his head, and looked over to Eddie before turning in. I could tell he wanted to say something, but he didn't. Good idea, Eddie replied as he walked over and started banking the fire. He reached inside the truck and pulled out a pail of sand and set it nearby. And with a wink, he added, Just in case. I nodded and said, I'll be up for a while longer. I'm not that sleepy. George called out from the tent and said, I just don't want to hear about somebody's cattle getting mauled by a tiger in the middle of the night tomorrow. I laughed and said, I promise, no cattle mutilations. The next day found us moving deeper into the mountains of West Virginia. All of the photographs I'd seen of this country had been in black and white, and to be honest, pardon a pun, but 
they coloured my impressions of what it should be. Living it in colour and living glory of the springtime in these mountains was a completely different experience. Yes, we travelled through areas of crushing poverty and there were the occasional shacks where a family far too large for the structure struggled to scratch a life out of the thin mountain soil. Yes, a great many of the people we met there were shoeless or their clothes were converted flower sacks. But at the same time, there really was a quiet dignity to them. They prided themselves on giving an honest day's work for an honest pay. But when we entered into the small town of Cold Creek, I felt something different. Here, the poverty pressed against more than just the people, it pressed against their souls. I could feel something wrong here, in the overly gaunt faces. Many of them moved as if they had no mind of their own, or had just lost all hope of any salvation. The sense I got from more than one of them told me that they would not survive more than a few more days of this existence. Something was poisoning the town. I looked at George and Eddie and said, Try to avoid eating anything here in town. When? Don't you think these people have anything to eat for themselves, much less share with us? Eddie said. I know, I told him, but I think something is poisoning them. They don't look right, they don't smell right, and they don't feel right. <sighs> I don't need the senses of a cat to tell that, Win. George said. There's definitely something wrong here, and I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that Lamech and the Elu have something to do with it. I think you're probably right there, George. Still, I worry about you guys. Ah, stop worrying, Wynn. Eddie berated me. We're big boys. We can take care of ourselves. I nodded and pulled up to the Cabell's Cold Creek General Store. Wait here, guys. I'm going to get some directions to the mine. And I walked into the cool darkness of the store and the first smell that hit was that of rotten vegetables. I looked over to the rows of bins and saw several rats sitting along them. A woman with a gaunt face and bloated body stood behind the counter, staring at some of the distant spots on the far wall. I got the feeling that whatever was inside her was no longer human. And screwed up my courage, I asked, Can you, uh, can you direct me to the Cold Creek Mine? Who wants to know? She asked harshly as if her voice had not been used in some time. The owner, I told her. Owner's dead, back east, the woman said sadly. I shook my head and said, not hardly. One of the best parts about being sent back in time was that I got to steal all the good lines before they're ever used. Old owner's dead, the woman repeated. New owner took possession last week. I raised an eyebrow and asked again, Can you direct me to the mine? And she nodded her head and said, Just follow the railroad. It leads right to the mine. I nodded and said, Thanks. I wouldn't go out there, young man, she said. Folks who go out there come back changed. You won't like the change. They won't like you. I nodded and said, <laughs> I take my chances. Then, stopping, I wove a rune in the dust on the window and sang a small spell. You will forget that I was here. Her eyes flew open, her voice changed to something deep and ominous. Those words, that song, you're the sky of summer, gulls the deer. I turned and looked at her in surprise. How did she know my mother's name? And suddenly, outside the horn on the truck began to beep. I looked outside to see where all the people in the streets had dropped everything they were doing and turned towards the store. Many of them carried makeshift weapons in their hands, and none of them looked like they wanted to discuss the recent trade between St. Louis Browns and the Washington Senators. All of them had a cold, dead look on their face that made me wonder if they were even alive. When George was laying on the horn of the truck as Eddie was standing on the running board fumbling with the packs in the back looking for the Henry, I was sure. 
As I came down the short set of steps leading up to the front of the store, someone grabbed at me, and I spun down with my fist drawn back to look in the face of a kid that couldn't be older than nine or ten. A he or she, I couldn't tell which it was through the dirt and grime and under the floppy hat. I cringed back and stopped myself from taking a swing. Take me away with you, the child hissed. Please. Like I said, there are times when we are guided by that inner compass our lady instilled in us. This was one of those times. I scooped him up, or her up, and tossed them too. Skinny child into the cab of the truck with George and yelled at Eddie, Hang on! This, this is going to be rough. Well, thankfully, George had already started to ford, so I slammed the door shut, hid the clutch and slammed it in reverse, and accelerated backwards. Well, at least one of the creatures, for I was beginning to realise that my horror that this whole town was made up of the same creatures who'd attacked me in Colonial Bay got clipped hard. I heard an awful sound as they fell under the tyres, and there was no cry of pain, just the horrible sounds of bones crunching beneath the weight of the vehicle. I slammed the truck into first and gunned the engine, letting off the clutch simultaneously. I had timed my double clutch just right, and we shut ahead and started gaining speed down the road, in the direction that the shopkeeper had indicated for the mine. What you going this here way for? The child in the seat between George and me screamed. This is where they take it to kill you. And George gave the kid a startled look and asked, We're open to suggestions. We can't go back, kid. I watched the road, but I could almost feel the kid's mind working for an option. Up ahead, that's a dirt road. If you can drive this thing, then take it. It goes up a ways the mountain. They don't like none of that up there. Who are you? George asked as I yanked the wheel hard to the right and downshifted to handle the rising grade. The kid wasn't kidding about needing to know how to drive. The road was narrow, rutted and within a hundred yards started forming a sheer drop-off on the right as the little valley fell away sharply. The kid turned to look at George and said, Name's Willie Thomas. How come you're not one of those things back there then, Willie? George asked a question that was on my mind. The kid laughed, pointed to the dirt-covered overall front with his equally dirt-covered thumb, and said proudly, Because I'm faster, I'm smarter than they are. And he grinned and added, And because I'm smart enough to get into places they can't. Well, Willie, that was either brave or foolish of you back there. If you were safe and good at running, then why didn't you stay hidden? George asked. Before the boy could answer, there was a low grumble from his stomach. He frowned and said, Because them things don't eat. And worst as yet, they let a good food rot. I was trying to find me something to eat. I figured I could maybe catch a ride with you fellas and get out of here for they got to me. I nodded to the flour sack on the floor next to George's feet. I think there's some biscuits left in there. They're a couple of days old, but they can hold you over until we find some place to stop and make camp. Well, he started to grab for the sack, but then stopped and seemed to remember his manners. I thank you right kindly, mister. I smiled as I concentrated on the road. Where are your folks? I asked. And from the corner of my eye, I caught the flash of pain across his face before he said, Mine has took him. I was down fishing in the creek when they came and got him. Next, uh, next time I see them, they, they were like that. Mama tried to catch me. I ran and been running since. And he tore into the biscuit with a gusto of someone who was starving. Oh, is there a place up here we can camp? Some place defensible. And the boy nodded and said, They don't none like it much up here. Don't know what it is. But they don't come up here. And I've been hiding out in the old Turner's place. They packed up and moved to Guinea last fall. Guinea? George asked. Who is she? And the boy gave George a disbelieving look. Not who? Where? Guinea? Old Dominion? You know, east of here. And the light dawned on George's face. You mean Virginia? And the boy got a defiant look on his face and said, I mean what I said, mister. 
You call it that. We call it Guinea. There was a pounding on the cab of the truck and I pounded back yelling out the window. Let me find a safe place to stop. Eddie pounded his understanding with two quick raps and I looked for a white place in the road to stop and see what he needed. We had to travel nearly another mile before the road wound out into a small plateau that looked out over the town below. I pulled the truck back where the drop-off below gave it some cover from possible rifle fire from down below. My family was far from rural Alabama and so I knew just how deadly these mountains folk could be with a long gun. I knew a great many of them who'd gone off to the Great War came home with their Enfields and Springfields and didn't want to give them a clear shot. As I pulled the truck over and out of the way, I felt the weight of the truck shift and Eddie dropped down. There was a low growl and then the bark of a Henry. I came out of the truck at full tilt only to find one of the Draug lying on the ground, half of his head missing. Eddie was cocking a Henry's lever forward to chamber another round. He hung on all the way up the road. I looked over to the short redhead and smiled. How did you keep him from climbing into the bed with you? He bent down and pulled up his right pant leg to reveal several deep scratches. I kicked him in the head. He shook his head and said, Damn, they're strong. I nodded and started to rummage through the packs looking for the first aid kit. And finding it, I said, Let me put something on that. And with the help of my mum and sister-in-law, I had managed to stock it with stuff from my own time that I knew was going to be more effective than what was available in the 30s. But for this, I figured I'd start with the basics. I pulled out a small bottle of rubbing alcohol and said, This is, this is going to sting. He nodded and said, Ah, just put it on. I'm not a baby. I tucked my head with a smile and poured it down his leg and then grabbed his ankle to make sure that he couldn't pull it back until all the alcohol had soaked into the deep gashes. He struggled against my grip for a second and I heard him make a small painful noises. And finally, I looked back over my shoulder to see both George and Woolly staring at me. I caught George's eye and then looked at Woolly and he understood. Come on, Woolly. Give me a hand getting this stuff straightened up so we won't lose it. When I was sure that the kid wasn't looking, I popped a claw and drew a rune in my palm with my own blood. And singing a spell, I pressed my palm to Eddie's leg and watched the wounds begin to close. And he looked down at me and growled. Was that necessary? I grinned at him as I stood. Yeah, it was. I wanted to make sure those wounds don't get infected. I turned and pointed to the dead thing on the ground and said, There's no telling what that thing's nails carry. I then grinned at him and said, Like I said, I watch out for my friends. Now it's all secured, Wynn. George called from the truck. I knew there was as much a question there as there was a comment. Good. Patting Eddie on the shoulder here, I added, I think our sharpshooter here is gonna live. Eddie smiled sheepishly and then, when he was sure that the boy wasn't looking, pulled his pants leg slightly to show that deep gouges had already faded to nasty red welts. I knew they had to burn like hell though. Good, George said, jumping down from the back of the Ford and then helping the boy down. Setting him on the ground, he said, Boy, you need some meat on your bones. Willie looked up at him defiantly and said, I've been working on it. How far is it to this? To this Turner place? I asked Willie. He pointed to the top of the ridge about a mile away. It's up there. He stopped for a moment and looked at me before saying, But I warn you, the Turners, they were witch people. I think that's why them things won't go up there. There is a fear of something up there. I nodded and said, well, Maybe we can use that. Let's get moving. I want to make it up there and look around and pick your brain for some information. Maybe set up a base of operation. And a boy he gave me a strange look and asked, You a government man? And I shook my head and said, No, I'm not the revenue either. I own a mine. I came to check it out. Caught into that general store. A new owner bought it from the last new owner, he said. 
and I crossed my arms and asked, And who is the new owner? Somebody named Lamech, he replied. George, Eddie and I looked at each other before I said, Not hardly. Maybe she thinks you're dead and nobody will come looking for a while, George said. I can't imagine them not knowing I'm still alive. Surely they aren't that stupid that they won't follow up to make sure they did the job. You talking like you know this Lemek guy, Willie said. I never met her, I told him. But she did try to have me killed by sending a bunch of those Jarogs after me. Ah, uh, that's what they're called? He asked. I nodded and said, Close as I can tell, they're a form of walking dead that the ancient Vikings used to fear. Vikings? Ain't they some kind of old world bad guys or something? Willie asked. I smiled at him and said, Or oh, something. And this woman tried to kill you? He looked me up and down and said, You look awful spry to be been attacked by a bunch of them things. I laughed and told him, I'm harder to kill than I look. He just nodded and said, A real tough guy, huh? Kid, you have no idea, George said. Now, let's get back on the road so we can figure out what to do next. As we continued to head up the mountain, an idea came to mind. Willie might be the perfect thing I needed to keep George and Eddie out of the worst of it. If I made him their responsibility, then he was just likely to be slippery enough to keep them occupied. The danger in that was, if he was too slippery, then he could get himself and them killed. Well, it was something to think about. An hour later, when we pulled into the Turner place, well, I could feel the magic around the place. Maybe there was something to what Woolly said about them being witch folk. A term I knew was sometimes applied to people in the mountains who had a touch of magic or PSI to them. The house was not what I was expecting. Although there were lines running to it, there was obviously no electricity to it now. But it was well built, unpainted clapboard home that had a long since turned to a silver grey, another run-down shack that I was expecting. A large sandstone chimney stood at either end, and there was a nearby stream of water as a source. Evidently, the Turners had a substantial source of income. When I first heard the story of them packing up and leaving, I thought it was due to the depression, but it seemed like they were doing okay for themselves. I turned to Woolly and asked, Why did the Turners say they were leaving? Woolly shrugged his shoulders and said, I never heard from them myself, but, but I overheard Mr. Grandin down at the store tell my pa that they told him that something bad was coming, and they didn't want to be here for it. George turned and asked, Could they have heard about the Yalu? I shrugged and said, Some of these mountain folk have a real mage talent. They may have sensed it and decided to move on instead of staying and fighting against something they couldn't stop. So where does that leave us? Eddie asked. That leaves us right where we started before. I'm going to slip into the mine this evening and see what I can find out. You and George are going to keep an eye on Woolly for me and get the gear ready for a possible assault. You expecting them to attack up here? Woolly asked. I shook my head and said, No, I mean us possibly having to assault them. Sometimes the best offence is a good offence. He shook his head and a dirty blonde lock of hair fell out from under his hat. As he shoved it up under his cap, I asked, Willie, is that short for Wilhelmina? This was getting better and better. The kid looked at me in shock and started to say something. I fixed her with my gaze and lay just a little at the tiger surface. She looked down and nodded and said, How do you know? What? George demanded. You're a girl? He shook his head and said, Come on out of the outhouse. I'm glad I... Decided to wait until I got here instead of us using a tree. The girl pulled her hat off and long blonde hair poured out from under it. It was a definite need of a wash and a trim. How did you know? I smiled and said, 
Uh, the way you shoved your hair back up under your hat. A boy would have let it fall out and not worry about it. She just nodded and asked. What are you going to do now? Put me in a dress and make me take a bath? I smiled and said, Not in that order, and not now. Seems to me this has worked out for you pretty well so far, and kept you alive. My mum used to tell me, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I nodded and said, But if we can find your relatives before we leave this area, I'm taking you with me back to... I paused for a moment and smiled, saying, Back to Guinea. I'm not going to leave you up here on this mountain to die of starvation or privation. I can take care of myself, she protested. I nodded and said, As best as I can tell, that's not in question. But I have a duty to protect people. And leaving you here would it be fulfilling that duty. Well, I'm not wearing a dress, she demanded. I raised an eyebrow and said, I didn't say you had to. Yet, we'll talk about this later. In the meantime, I want to get our base of operations set up here. I plan on moving out tonight to do some reconnaissance. Maybe take a deer or something to provide us with a bit of extra protein in case this turns into a siege situation. Now, give us a hand with the supplies. And for some reason, that simple statement did more to calm her racing heart than anything I think I could have said. Both George and Eddie kept giving me strange looks. I think they thought I'd taken complete leave of my senses. Exactly what they thought I had in mind, I don't know. But I had a plan. Sort of. As I began pulling packs off the truck, Eddie stepped up close to me and asked, Exactly, what are you planning, Wynn? Well, like I said, I'm going out for some reconnaissance to get the lay of the land. Also, I want to bring down a deer. If this turns into a siege situation, I'd rather us have plenty of strength to fight them off. About watching after the girl, he said. I'm making her yours and George's responsibility, I said. And who put you in charge? He demanded. You did the moment you agreed to tag along with me, knowing what I was doing, I told him. Ah, she's going to be more trouble than she's worth. He protested. I turned to look at him and said, She's a child. How could you say something like that? She may be able to take care of herself, but... But how long do you think she was really going to last against Lamech and her drawogs? Eventually, she'd have been caught. I smiled and said, Besides, she knows the lay of the land and has her own survival skills. And by saddling her with me and George... You can keep us occupied while you handle the dangerous stuff, he said. I smiled and said, There is that, but to be honest, I'm hoping that the survival skills she's developed living on her own here for a while will keep us all alive. I'm not going to waste good resources. And as far as I'm concerned, she's a gift from my goddess. You have a funny attitude about women, Wynne, he said. <laughs> so I've been told, I replied. But... You're starting to develop it too. What do you mean? He asked. You're starting to see them as real human beings. Just look at Dot. Ah, let's leave Dot out of this, he said, clenching his fists. Let's not, I told him. I have nothing but good things to say about her. She's strong, she's smart, and she's pretty. I think she's the perfect match for you. You're also starting to realize that she has something to add to the world other than being somebody's wife. That's very... I paused and smiled, and threw his own word back at him. Metropolitan of you. I think you're likely to be willing to listen to a warning coming from Willie, even if it is from a girl. He shrugged and blushed. She's lived here all her life. I'd be stupid not to. You see? I said. I know a lot of men who discount what she's managed to do. And just ignore her. By putting her with you and George, I might be able to get us all out of here alive. He just shook his head and said, I don't like it. You don't have to like it. I said, I just need you to do it. And I need you to keep her occupied while I slip out of camp tonight and 
check things out and get us some extra meat. Uh, you think there's you think there's deer in these mountains? He asked. I know there are, I said. But aren't they infected or contaminated? He asked. I shook my head and said, I don't think so. The Yalus seem to go after people, not the land. But you can always skip the venison and eat the spam. He frowned at me and said, You're evil. Do you know that when? Actually, I'm just the opposite, I told him. He chuckled and said, Okay, you mean. I'm a realist, I told him. First order of... First order of business is survival. After that is information. And after that, stopping the Elu. I told him. And if that little girl gets caught up in it, he asked. Then we're three grown men, and we do what men are supposed to do for lost little girls. We rescue her, I told him. And when we get back to Virginia, he asked. Yeah, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. If all else fails, I'm building a new house. An extra bedroom won't be a problem. And I'm sure Jimmy's dad knows a judge or two that might be able to help get us settled. If we can't find any family, that is. You really going to take responsibility for someone else's kid? He asked, surprised. Of course, I said. I've got the resources, and I'm damn sure not going to leave her here to die. That is, if you and George can keep her alive through this. I said, challenging him. His eyes hardened, and he said, I'll keep her alive just to watch you saddle yourself with her. Maybe it'll settle down this need you have to solve all the world's problems. This coming from the guy who insisted on tagging along to get a piece of Jimmy's killer? I said. That's different, he protested. Right, I told him. Not believing it. But it did put him in the mindset I wanted him to be in. It didn't take us long to set up shop in the Turner's old house. And I was starting to believe that my suspicions about them were right on the money. The way things were laid out, the materials used in the building of the house, and the general feel of it told me that whomever had lived here before I understood at least the basics of sympathetic and associative magic. No wonder the Yilu didn't like this place. As the sun set behind the hills on the other side of the valley where the town of Cold Creek was nestled, I could feel the minds of the Yilu reaching out to find us. They still didn't have the skull, and seemed to actually believe that I would bring it with me. My estimation of their intelligence actually went down with that. As I watched the sky turn orange, and then purple, and finally a velvet of black splattered with stars, Willie came up next to me and asked, Are you really gonna go out there tonight? I nodded and said, Yeah. You know them things have... They have eyes like cats. They can see pretty good at night. I smiled and put a hand on her shoulder and said, I'm pretty good at night too. You don't act like them other city fellas, she said. You don't talk like them either. No, I don't, I told her. I'm probably not like any fella you've ever met. Ah, that sounds about right, she said. She pointed to the south where another valley intersected the one below us to the west. There's a shallow river that cuts through there. And there's a pond there where the deer come to drink. And if you keep following it, it'll lead you to the mine. And she looked up at me and said, It was nice knowing you, mister. I already thank you for saving me today and I hate to see you get yourself killed. But if you're going out there, I might as well tell you something that might help you. I smiled at her and said, I appreciate it. I still think you're out of your mind for wanting to go, but I can't stop you. Well, just do me a favor, okay, Willie? I asked. What? Keep an eye on Eddie and George for me. They don't always understand how these things work, I said. She gave me a skeptical look and asked, And you do? I shrugged and replied, More than... You might think. She shrugged and replied. I try to keep you city boys out of mischief, but I don't think they're likely to listen to me. I heard he will, I told her. If what you say makes sense, then he'll listen. And where are you going? She asked. I smiled and said, and a little bit. 
Are you taking your rifle with you? She asked nervously. I shook my head and said, No, I'm leaving out here for you guys to use. I stopped and asked, Can you shoot? I can usually hit what I'm aiming at, she said. But I don't think your friends are likely to let me use a rifle. I just wanted to make sure that you can, if you need to, in case you have to take care of my friends, I said. And she just smiled up at me. We seemed to have come to an understanding of sorts. I wasn't going to dismiss what she had to say because she was a kid, or because she was from these mountains, and she was at least going to hear me out. I think she still thought I was out of my mind, but she would at least hear me out, and that, well, that was the start. I led her back inside the house and locked the door. The smell of beans and salted pork was coming from a fireplace in the kitchen where George and Eddie were preparing dinner. And George looked up and asked, You gonna eat before you head out? Well, I shook my head and said, No, I hump better on an empty stomach. Give my share to Woolly. George smiled at me and I knew he knew what I was doing. If this turned into a siege situation, we could end up on a short ration. I'd rather take care of the kid when I could fend for myself in the forest. Well, he just shrugged and said, Suit yourself. You're going to anyway. I laughed and said, You see, you're catching on. Yeah, he told me. And there was a bit of bite in his voice when he said it. And we're going to have to have a talk about when this problem is solved and we're back in Colonial Bay. I knew he was chafing at me saddling him with Woolly, and I knew he knew why I did it. Ah, fine. When we get home all safe and sound then, I told him. We're not kidding about this when Eddie chimed in. I know, I know, I told him. I never said you had to like it. Just do it, I said. What are you free arguing about? Woolly asked. And George looked at a dirty young girl and said, Oh, he'll find out. Anybody that win decides is his friends or needs his help. He gets very protective of, and sometimes, when they can, handle themselves. I remember that the next time we hear a sound in my basement, I told him, reminding him of when he first found out what I was. It can, it can wait, George suddenly said. Good, I replied. Now you three have a super nice supper, and then make sure this door is locked and the rifle is nearby. Why you go scout the area, Eddie said. While I go scout the area and do some hunting, I told him. You ain't gonna take the rifle? Woolly asked. And I shook my head and said, no. Why how you gonna kill a deer? Run it down? She asked skeptically. I smiled and said, something like that. I then slipped out the door and left the three to eat their meal. I had things to do. <laughs>